All right, thank you so much for the way too kind introduction, I, I think. Um, so yeah, happy to be here. Uh, great pleasure. I've been here once before, um, 2016, I think we just said before. So it's really nice to to be back. I even found the Leaning Tower without a map when I when I arrived here. It's pretty much a straight shot, but I still found it. So it's uh, I've, I've seen it already today. Um, so great to be here. I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to jump right in. Um, I'm not quite sure where you guys are in terms of. You know, some of you may know more, some a little less about corporate responsibilities, especially also about business and human rights. Now, if I talk about things that you have no clue about and think, but what is he talking about? Just let me know. And then I can, can maybe go a little bit deeper, or give you some context and so on. Um, because we touch, especially in the, towards the end of the, of the presentation, we touch on some of the, the more recent developments. And some of them in the business and human rights kind of circle and bubble are well known, obviously, but I'm not quite sure whether whether you have heard about them. And, and if 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 they don't really mean much to you, just let me know. And otherwise, if, if there are questions in between, just interrupt and, and ask. Right. And uh, so we can we can adjust to that. I'm going to jump right in. Um, so the aim of this presentation uh, or what I'm let's let's put it that way, what I what I will try to do is assess some of those recent developments, um, international developments, domestic developments, and also some at the, at the corporate level. And I do so in terms of, in a way, how new they are in how they understand corporate responsibility, right? So is what we see now, what, what, what's kind of popping up in the business and human rights space, is this really new thinking on corporate responsibility or is it kind of same old? Same old, right? So that's the that's the assessment, and that that the starting point or that the the main or basic thesis underlying this, of course, is that business and human rights. If we think business and human rights, we need to think both both business and human rights differently, right? So if, if at, at least if you want to have kind of if you want to think business and human rights correctly, um, I think we need a new approach to both business responsibility and to human rights. And then we assess, well, what we see now emerging, does this really entail this kind of new thinking or is it just kind of what we've had all along, right? Just with a new branding, basically. So that's the aim. And the agenda is fairly straightforward, I guess. Uh, I'll start with a very general brief introduction to, to business and human rights, just to give you some, some idea of what we're actually talking about for those who have never really heard about business and human rights. Um, and then we talk about this learning and unlearning or unlearning and relearning um, business and human rights, which I think is necessary to understand business and human rights. Right? Uh, we'll get there. Um, then we look at the conceptual differences between more conventional understandings of corporate <laughs> responsibility and business and human rights. <clears throat> and then in the very end, some reflections uh, on those kind of recent uh, emerging developments. So very <clears throat> briefly, um, introducing business and human rights. Is this something, is business and human rights something new to you guys or, or do you, have, have you guys been talking about this at all? Not so much? Okay, so this is maybe not, and if you, if you have heard about these things and I'm basically just repeating what you know already anyway, let me know as well, then we can just skip um, the slides, right? But otherwise, so, Business and human rights, and maybe to you as well, uh, business and human rights as kind of a, 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 a creation of, of words is, is to some may be fairly counterintuitive, right? Because normally or traditionally we view, view those two concepts as two separate domains, right? Those who have talked about business, also corporate responsibility, have not really talked about human rights. And those who have talked about human rights have not really talked about um corporate responsibility or business, right? And bringing those two things together um, may sound fairly um, counterintuitive um, to some. And the consequence of this, of course, is that um, business violations of human rights, um, or, or let's put it that way, corporate conduct has been has, has provided a, a, a quite fertile ground to, to violate um, human rights. Because businesses did not think about human rights, and as such, they did not necessarily have human rights violations on their radar. And if you don't have them on their radar, if you don't really specifically look for human rights violations, you might not notice them when they when when they happen. Right. So you, you do your business as usual, 
and you don't really pay attention to what the what the implications of that may be. And on the other hand, those who have actually thought about human rights did not have business on the radar, and as such, created systems and mechanisms um, that did not account for business violations. Right. And so you have this blind spot of, of business and human rights where, where then human rights violations by corporations go unaccounted for. Right? And I think that's one of the one of the main problems that we've seen um, in the past. Right? And so and so then the the idea is that if we want to get a grip on this um, problem, um, we need to kind of unlearn what we know about human rights and we need to unlearn what we know about corporate responsibility or business to bring those two things together and then to address um, those violations of human rights that occur uh, through business. So learning business and human rights implies that we unlearn human rights and we unlearn um, business. That's kind of the starting point from which we kind of depart. Um, today. Just very briefly, what, what do we mean by, by business and human rights? I tried to just very, in a nutshell, define it. Of course, it's, it's a big discussion. Um, but what does that discussion do? That's in, the, in this frame there. It is the, the business and human rights discussion is concerned with the justification, the definition and the delineation of corporate human rights responsibility. So thinking about what, what is actually the responsibility of business. Uh, and then with the conceptualization and assessment and respective accountability and remedy mechanism. Right? So that's the accountability piece. So thinking about what is the responsibility and how do we actually get businesses to do what we want them to do. That's the accountability piece, right? And that already kind of implies a little bit that there's, there's a certain separation perhaps between a legal discussion in the field and a non-legal discussion, right? So, so lawyers, legal scholars, are tend to be mostly concerned with the accountability piece, so thinking about well, what kind of laws do we need and so on. Um, and non-legal scholars in the field, they're maybe more thinking or reflecting about well, what is actually the underlying responsibility of business, right? And then of course you have this big overlap in the in the middle. But but it's those two kind of camps that we that we see in the business and human rights um, discussion. And this discussion, and I get there a little more thoroughly just in a, in a second, the discussion really emerges in the 19, late 1980s, early to mid 1990s, right? That, that's when, at least when, the, when a kind of a broad international discussion on this issue starts to take off. Um, and has really become to, until today, one of the, it's, it's one of the most significant, I think, discussions in the corporate responsibility space in this really large field now. And, and if you look at where the, they're really fast and 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 important um, things happen. It really is in the business and human rights space. So if you if you study corporate responsibility, you do need to have a focus on on business and human rights. Otherwise, you're on the wrong train, right? So if, if that if that's what you're interested in, you need to to have a, at least a, an eye on business and human rights um, discussion. It's a very interdisciplinary discussion by now, even though it started in the legal studies. Um, but by now we have, we have, um, people from management, from political science, business ethics, all, you know, it's, it's a really very dynamic interdisciplinary, um, discussion. What is also interesting, I think about it is, is that the boundaries between scholarship and say advocacy, activism, um, and so on is fairly, fairly uh, permeable and, and fluid. Right? So many scholars have different hats on also, right? that, they, that they also kind of in the, in the activism space, but do scholarship on the side. I think it has something to do with the nature of human rights, that, that it's difficult to do scholarship on human rights, especially on human rights violation, without actually being some sort of an activist at the same time. Because if you do, you know, investigate those violations, I think it's difficult not to actually take a position on, on them. Right? And if you take a position, I think then the the step to actually becoming engaged also outside of scholarship is, is a fairly small one. But I think it's a good thing. I think that is actually what what makes the field also really interesting. Let me try here. Oh, OK, I got it. So just very, very briefly um, on the on the emerging uh, emergence of the business and human rights movement. Before I said it, it emerged like late 1980s, early to mid 1990s. It is often connected to one very specific event, right? And that's the the execution of Ken Saraviva, who, who was I don't know if you if you know who, who he was. He was um, a Nigerian playwright and and activist who who was kind of fighting for the the, the rights of the Ogoni people in, in Nigeria and specifically against 
um, Western oil companies who were were kind of extracting oil in the Niger Delta in, in Nigeria uh, left a huge mess and and destruction. And because of his activism, he was he was um, eventually um, prosecuted, arrested, and and executed along with eight of his um, fellow activists. And this is kind of the event that many people connect to really this kind of trigger point of the business and human rights discussion because it sparked international protests. And if I if I talk about things that you've heard already, um, just let, again, let me know, right? So then then I just skip over this. I don't want want to repeat things that you already you know it's like heard many times. Um, that sparked international protests, especially NGOs started to see, okay, well, there is something to talk about and to investigate in this intersection between business and human rights. They started to build capacities, create departments even uh, to look at this at this intersection. They authored reports and published them. And then businesses started to see, okay, well, there's a new there's a new thing there. We might actually be vulnerable to this and started to build capacity uh, too. Shell was one of the first ones to actually, to, to actually after this incident, to, to kind of build capacity in the business and human rights um, area. We saw lawsuits against companies for human rights violations emerge in the mid 1990s. Uh, there's now a, a 30 of, uh, year old history of, of, of lawsuits, and we'll talk a little more about this at the very end of the, of the, of the talk. So one thing led to the other, right? And this is really kind of how, how, how things started. Now, of course, it's always relative, right? Where, we, where you put the starting point of a discussion. If you, if you ask the people in the Nitro Delta, when did the business and human rights discussion start? They wouldn't say when Ken Zaravivo was killed, but when we started opposing the oil companies back in the 1970s, right? Or you could even go all the way back to the Nuremberg trials right after the Second World War, when, when industrialists were tried for a collusion with the Nazi regime, right? And so we have to, I think that that's the point, I think we have to distinguish and differentiate between local struggles of, of local people against companies that may not necessarily be seen very often still today, and kind of the large international discussion and movements, which fo often focuses on, on, on very kind of prominent cases, right? But of course, the struggles there, they're much, much older than what we now say, this is the business and human rights discussion. It's also it's, it's also very different, right? It's it's really a, a struggle for for survival for for those people in the in the Niger Delta. <clears throat> also, if you if you look at the institutionalization of business and human rights, this emerges also kind of in the 1970s with the UN Draft Code. I'm just I'm just going to touch on this. I'm not going to go through all of this in in detail. But the UN Draft Code was an idea or, or an attempt by the UN to regulate multinational companies at the global level, and and this draft code had a, a, a few, very few hints towards human rights and towards um, racist regimes and, and how companies should deal with, with those. So it really started kind of in the, in the 1970s, the OECD guidelines, for example, also 1976, with one very brief mention of, of human rights back then. If you look at the OECD guidelines today, it has a, a, a whole chapter on, on, on human rights. Right? Um, so it's also a progression there. It started in 1970s, but then really kind of became a centerpiece of, of, of um, soft law and regulation of multinational companies in the, in the 1990s, 2000s. Right? The, the UN Global Compact, I'm not sure maybe you're familiar with, with the UN Global Compact, uh, is often referred to as the most kind of prominent and successful um, initiative in the, in the space of corporate responsibility. And that has that the first two principles are human rights principles, right? and that was put in place in 2000. So this is really kind of when, when it started to be, become institutionalized. The most important, I think, um, development was in two, 2005, when the UN installed a UN Special Representative for Business and Human Rights, that was John Ruggie, maybe you've heard of, uh, about him. And in 2011, he published the UN Guiding Principles for Business and Human Rights. And the UN Guiding Principles for Business and Human Rights, that's kind of the, the authoritative framework um, today that, that kind of outlines what the responsibility of businesses are uh, in terms of human rights. It's a soft law instrument, so it's not binding, at least not for corporations. Um, uh, but if you, if you look at the kind of institutionalization of the field, you see this kind of pendulum that swings back and forth between attempts to make human rights responsibility for corporations binding. Usually those failed, and then it, it swings back to attempts to kind of be more pragmatic and, and uh, trying to kind of 
come up with, with weaker soft law, multi-stakeholder uh, frameworks to, to at least kind of incentivize and, and encourage companies to observe human rights. Right? Right now, we have kind of the pendulum swinging back again to more the kind of the binding attempt. So we have also in the Human Rights Council, right now they're negotiating a, or at least discussing um, the idea of a human rights treaty. Um, and we'll see where that is going. We'll also touch back on this one at the very end of the, the presentation, right? But uh, what is in place right now is the EU and guiding principles. That's really where everybody is looking at. Right? Um, and we talk more about those as well. Clarification questions, just raise your hand. Yes, absolutely. Or just kind of interrupt. Yeah, yeah. Anytime. Exactly. If I, if I talk about things and you, you have no context, just let me know. I can, we can expand on those things. Um, also at the domestic level, so that's the international level. At the domestic level, we see quite a push for institutionalization today as well. And those you, you might you may have seen, right? I said the whole number of, of laws um, that have been enacted or initiatives that are popping up, especially in Western European uh, countries, in France, for example, the duty of vigilance law, um, the German uh, Germans have enacted a law on kind of supply chain human rights responsibility. There's this proposal now for a directive at the EU level, which is also pulling in the same uh, direction. Switzerland has a law. Um, and so on. So more and more countries are, and, and that's nothing, really nothing else than the attempt to at least make part of the UNGPs, the UN guiding principles, binding at the at the domestic level. Right. So looking what's what's there at the international level, how can you break this down to the to the domestic level and make at least part of that um, binding for for businesses. Also, this we'll discuss a little more um, at the end. All right, I'll just leave it at, at, at this for now, because I think this kind of sets the scene enough to then uh, move uh, in the assessment. Overall, what we see is kind of a hardening of soft, you often speak of a hardening of soft law, right? So at the international level, it's mostly soft, soft law, and now there's a hardening happening in the domestic space, right, making it binding. All right, now we get to the unlearning human rights piece. Um, so, so why do we need to unlearn what we know about human rights to think business and human rights differently? Right? And I kind of alluded to this before already a little bit. The traditional, at least political view on human rights is that they represent kind of a, a protection or a shield against abusive governments, right? This is what we often think intuitively about when we hear human rights, right? This is, it's, it's a, a protective measure against government and, and their, their power, right? And so they were, were meant to kind of limit state autonomy and state sovereignty, um, to limit the space in which governments can legitimately say, well, this is internal affairs, right? So there's, there's certain boundaries to what governments can just claim, you know, this is our sovereign right to, to do. So you, you can't treat your people just any way you want. That's the very point of, of human rights and human rights law. Whereas the rest of the international law is trying to protect the autonomy and the sovereignty of, of states, right? Human rights law draws the boundary of how, how far can you actually go in this. Um, so that's, the, that's the, the, the general idea, right? And that is why corporations have traditionally been rather off the radar of human rights scholars, right? They look at states, not at corporations, when they think about um, human rights. And of course, they're not oblivious that corporations have impacts on human rights, but they don't necessarily see this primarily as a problem of corporate responsibility, but they see it primarily as a state failure, right? So if corporations violate human rights, the state has not fulfilled its duty to protect its people from their corporation. And so it should be the state who actually does something and not necessarily primarily the corporation, right? But then in the last like 30 to 40 years, we also have seen profound transformations at the global level, right? And, and some people speak of kind of a, a post-Westphalian constellation or post-national constellation, Habermas, that we that we move into where states lose power and other institutions gain power to the same extent. And of course, multinational companies or companies as such are among those institutions that have gained, in some instances, dramatic power, right? And and are, depending on how we measure it, uh, almost as powerful as as not even only small states, but but even medium medium. Um, size states, right? 
And so what happens then is basically if you, if you combine the, the limited reach of, of, of nation state within the global sphere and this kind of these, these connected and integrated global markets with the power, the, the, the rising power of multinational companies, um, then you see that there's certain governance gaps emerging where companies can kind of move and do without being held accountable what they uh, for what they what what they do, and John Ruggie, the, the the UN special former UN special rep representative for business and human rights that I mentioned before, he has said, well, that, that those governance gaps that we see emerge, that's really the main issue to address in business and human rights because we have those governance gaps. That's why we need to have a discussion on on business and human rights. Of course, that can be debated whether this is really the root cause, but that's something that needs to be addressed, right? Um, and so the idea then, of course, is, well, how do we address those governance gaps? And I think if we want to address them thoroughly and really get to the root of addressing them, then we need to, 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 to rethink human rights, what right? is state centrism that is inherent to human rights thinking traditional. That needs to be rethought if we want to address those governance gaps in a profound way, right? So that's the unlearning human rights piece. <clears throat> And the same can be done, of course, on the other side, the unlearning business uh, piece. And there's two ways or two, two perspectives on business, right? Uh, the first one you've certainly heard, um, and that's also fairly intuitive that we need to rethink, at least I hope it's fairly intuitive that we need to rethink this kind of this view on, on corporate corporations. That's kind of the classical view on, on business, the Friedmanian view of business. And of course, you can write books about how Friedman meant his you know, statement that corporations have no other responsibility than to maximize profits. You probably heard about that one, right? Um, and there's actually that there is, of course, lots of writing on what did he actually exactly mean? Um, but we don't really have to care about this too much right now. Um, very often, the Friedmanian view is kind of set equal with kind of this more crude, um, classical um, shareholder value doctrine today, right? So that the, the idea that corporations don't need to do anything else than maximize the returns for shareholders, um, you know, kind of the means justify or the ends justify the means, right? If, if, if you maximize returns, you don't have to care about anything else because in the end, the system benefits and we are all better off for it. That's kind of the underlying thinking um, of that, right? Um, and of course the idea that corporations ought to have human rights responsibility inherently challenges that view that corporations should only maximize profits. Right? Um, human rights, I think you could justify it in a, in a, in a purely instrumental way on a, on a free meaning. You could say, well, if human rights respect pays for business, Maybe then you can, even from a Freedomanian point of view, justify the corporation should respect human rights. But that's a fairly limited view on corporate human rights responsibility. Right? Um, so we need to challenge that that point of view. But I think we need to go beyond that even, um, because even the what we call often the enlightened view of business, right? So the view that corporations have responsibility beyond just maximizing profit, even that can be problematic um, if we want to take at least a progressive uh, view on, on business and human rights, right? So I think business and human rights as a concept and an idea challenges even those conventional notions of corporate responsibility. And we do have to rethink those to some degree um, as well. And if I say conventional notion of, cor of, of corporate responsibility, I speak particularly of corporate social responsibility as a concept and an an idea. And you might not be fully familiar with corporate social responsibility. It's also a very fluffy term and there's lots of different interpretations. Um, but this is normally, but it's, it's kind of the most dominant, I think, stream of, of, of not only research, but also practice in corporate responsibility. Yeah. But do we have some like alternative economic models uh, where these uh, this structure is taken into account because we are like a master of science in economics and we always see like the profit like the maximization function that we have to do like the first derivative and taking into account the only profits but there are actually some alternative theories that entails 
these principles? That's exa- I mean, now we could skip all the way to the end of the, of the, of the presentation. So we'll, we'll, we'll see, right? So now the idea exactly based on this, the idea will be, so we'll look at some, some developments in the business and human rights space, for example, those laws, right? And, and then we ask, well, look, if, if you look at those laws that now emerge in, in different countries, do they really entail a different idea of business? Or does it actually just cater to, to this very idea of business and it will not actually change all that much, right? So this is exactly what we do. But just to give you a short answer, I think we do see that in, in um, different spaces, but I, I, I think I would be skeptical about seeing kind of a grand transformation of, you know, that, that we, we start to, to, to see a different way of doing business today. There, there are there are changes well, and these starting business uh, yeah. that because like the usual way of starting business today <laughs> in uh, an economics uh, course is like everything that that is far away from uh, the business ethics at least yeah. uh, in the microeconomic theory that we study. Exactly, and if, if 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 that's still the mainstream, right? Then it's also not a surprise that we don't see the profound transformation in practice, right? Because those are the people that will ultimately lead and shape those corporations, right? We do see, I think we do see spaces where we do see interesting new models emerge, right? And that there, there are interesting, very progressive companies very often. And that's also not a surprise. Very often they're fairly small, but in their niche, very successful and also, also uh, fairly powerful, right? But those are relatively small niches still. And then the question is, of course, how, how can we how can we scale this uh, the, the, these ideas and these, these models? But I think it is still an uphill battle, even even today. And I, I remember when I was a student, we already felt then, oh, now you know, now the transformation is coming. We had exactly the same discussions, right? And we're still having them. And and we're always feeling, oh, now we're at the at the verge of something new. But it seems to be so powerful these right. these ideas to and overcome. That's the whole reason why we have this course is precisely to challenge some of the assumptions yeah. that you get, unfortunately, to your mainstream economic courses. Yeah, exactly. That's where it starts, right? You know, uh, well, we can talk about it further uh, because, of course, there there's different business models now. As Gloria was mentioning, being uh, uh, becoming more dominant in a way, but that entails also rethinking, uh, if you want, uh, the behavioral psychology of the decision maker, of the economic decision maker. And there are changes in these behavioral dimensions uh, with the paradoxical framing. And uh, so there are changes being implemented, even in the point conceptually, about how you think about the home economicals uh, is thinking. Of course, it's uh, very far away from uh, perfect maximizer and a rational agent, uh, it's more in the world of the behavioral economics. But within the world of behavioral economics, you can think about decision making where you actually incorporate these dimensions. So, I mean, there's a lot of food for thought here. And there is, I mean, university is an interesting discussion, right? To what to, to what degree does the curriculum change and, and do university yeah. change? And it's a, I think it's a combination of, of many different factors, right? Students demanding different kinds of courses. I, I remember back then in business ethics course, I was one of like four students or so of a uni- university of like seven and a half thousand students, right? And now we have our courses full. So, so there you see a certain change. I think also new professors who come in, they have been kind of socialized in a different time. They have a, a, a different kind of mindset and a different approach to teaching economics, perhaps. And, and and business, but what's also important is that businesses actually, you know, demand from business schools that they offer those courses. I think if if that push is not coming from outside, there's little incentive for for business schools, particularly, to to actually change much about the curriculum. And and so far, what I see is that corporations often talk much about these things, right? That they say, oh, you know, we 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 like you know open-minded students and graduates and so on. But the pressure from outside on the universities, I think, is still largely missing, right? That they actually demand this from, from business school, that they say, look, we want a different kind of education of our students. I've not seen much of that. And so you see that there is, there is a certain discrepancy yeah, top, there, I think. Top MBA courses, uh, I would say Harvard and a few other places worldwide, 
are incorporating, not necessarily to mainstream economic courses, but they, they for instance, in management courses, you have more and more this kind of paradigm shift. Mm. And because then eventually this management, not everywhere, of course, but there are changes. No, that was just because of the yeah. paradigm shift. I think you see the development, right? But whether, whether the, the paradigm is shifting. It's too much. Yeah. I, I but we still see signals of change, let's say. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and of course, that's very important uh, if you do it in an executive uh, MBA course, for instance, or in a, a mass management course. Because that is where you read the, the new cohorts of managers and CEOs and entrepreneurs, mostly. Of course, also in economics, but mostly they come from management and they have been totally ill-equipped to deal with these issues. Now we are giving more, I mean, for instance, in my undergrad training in management, I do teach a lot of these issues. And then, like as a transversal uh, topic on any subject I touch upon, I talk about these issues. And, how to become responsible managers. Uh, and by responsible means, you know, in the very much business human rights framework of respecting human rights, doing no harm in the first place, etc. Yeah. So it's an us, but it's also on you guys, right? Yeah. To kind of push for <laughs> push for those those things, exactly. Um, where was I? Sorry. Yeah, if you if you no no that's that's that that's great that's that's what it's all about. Um, so if you if you look at CSR corporate social responsibility and how it is being not only practice, but also theorized. And you, you really go back and you read up on this, you, you will notice fairly quickly that human rights has, act, have, have actually not played all that much of a role in, in, in those theorization and, and in corporate responsibility practice, right? At least not to, all, to, to, to like up to the 2000s or so when the global compact came with the, the human rights principles and so on. And there's often, especially from CSR scholars, they often look at business and human rights as just kind of a, an emerging issue within the field of, of corporate social responsibility, or kind of even a subset of the corporate social responsibility discussion. But if you if you if you take that into consideration, um, you must come to the conclusion that that's not the case, right? So business and human rights is is a different discussion um, of the of the corporate responsibility discussion. It's actually a discussion that is fairly critical of corporate social responsibility for a number of reasons, and that's uh, I'll, I'll get there. Uh, just now. So what is the difference, right? What is the difference? And that's the unlearning again, the unlearning corporate social responsibility is what is the difference between corporate social responsibility thinking and business and human rights thinking? Right? In corporate social responsibility, the way that business responsibility is framed is, is normally, and I'm always looking at kind of the conventional, you know, kind of the average corporate social responsibility discussion, is normally conceptualized as private responsibility, the private responsibility of the of the business. And that is, of course, based on a fairly sharp distinction between the private space and the public space. Right? The public space is the domain of governments. Um, they shape the, 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 the public space, and that's not the domain of businesses, right? The business keep out of the of the public space. They're assigned to what the government defines as a private space, but within that private space, they're asked to behave responsibly that's corporate social responsibility but ultimately they can can do what they want right they can they, under those premises they can they can pursue their profits and so on but please do it in a responsible way that's kind of the idea of corporate social um responsibility and human rights of course belong to the public realm right and 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 so it's the domain of governments and not um the domain of business and that's why you have this this um, separation. Now, if you want to define what, what the implications are, what exactly that means to see corporate responsibility as private responsibility, I see at least, there's probably more, but at least four elements that are defining for understanding corporate social responsibility as private responsibility. The first one is that it's voluntary, right? Um, and it's often defined even as voluntary responsibility, meaning responsibility beyond compliance beyond what you actually have to do, what you what, what what is mandated by the state that you that you do. Right. And so you adopt responsibility beyond just complying to the laws and regulation on a voluntary basis. Now if you compare this to what human rights imply, you see that kind of conflict and discrepancy immediately, right? Because human rights obviously are not voluntary. Human rights, any right correlates with an obligation. So if you have a right, someone has an obligation. And if you speak of business and human rights, 
we speak we speak of business obliga obligations. So there's it, it must be beyond at least a simple and crude um, voluntariness. Right? It cannot be that human rights ultimately are made dependent of corporate goodwill and charity. Right? The very point of a right is that you can claim it. Right? It, it, it empowers you. It puts you in a different position. And if you can claim it, it's for the, the, the one who has to deliver. It's not, it's not voluntary anymore. Right? That's the point of a right. So you see that, that, that conflict between voluntariness and human rights responsibility. The second element is that it's, it's seen as apolitical and that we've defined based on this, this sharp distinction between private and public. Right? So corporate responsibility is in the private space and as such it's seen as apolitical. Human rights, on the other hand, are in the public space and as such it does presuppose a certain public and political responsibility. And if we, if we assign this to corporations, then it does not really match anymore with this understanding of corporate social responsibility as private. Right? So then we have to rethink corporate responsibility in a more public and, and political way. There are discussions in the corporate responsibility field that kind of push in that direction. And I think that is where I think the most promising developments happen in the corporate responsibility space. But I think we do need to rethink this idea of, of responsibility to really get a connection to um, human rights there as well. The third one is that corporate social responsibility is, is meant or is, is thought to be corporate centric. So the corporation is at the center of things. Um, it's a corporation who defines what responsibility means for them. It's a corporation who kind of picks and chooses the issues that they want to address in this private space because it's that's what it, it's meant to be, right? It's the corporation that prioritize certain responsibility over others, and they have to do that in a, in, in, in a sense. But it's always the corporation at the center. And even those who are familiar, for example, of you with uh, stakeholder theory, right? which intuitively you would say, no, I mean, stakeholder theory, you have, it's, it's about catering to different stakeholder groups. So even there, the corporation is always at the center. It's a corporation, you, you think stakeholder relationships from the center to the groups, right? And the corporation at the center. If you look at the business and human rights discussion, at least as it should be thought, um, it's rights holder centric, right? The rights holder should be, that's the point of empowerment, right? You you move, you shift the rights holder to the center of the of the equation. And as such, you you kind of rebalance power. Um, so it, it, that there's always a power power shift implied by business and human rights. You, you, you shift power to, um, to the rights holder, and as such, the corporation should at least ideally move out of the uh, out of the center and cater towards the um, towards the right holder, rights holder at the, the center. And then the last one, and that's kind of a, and it, 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 it almost derives from the other ones, is that corporate social responsibility is very often thought fairly instrumentally, meaning that um, corporations, of course, prioritize those responsibility where they see kind of a business rationale for it. Right? That's a whole, that, that's kind of this, this business case argumentation that, that corporate social responsibility ultimately should make business sense or should pay for, for, for companies. And, and this discussion you, or this rationale you see, you, you can go to any, I think, website of, of a larger company and look at how they how they define and justify corporate social responsibility. And they will say, we do it because we feel like it's better business to actually be responsible, right? But of course, it's, it, it's highly problematic if you use that as an actual justification for why you are adopting responsibility, right? But it's almost implied by this I private idea of, of, of responsibility. On the other hand, again, if you compare this to the nature of human rights, human rights are thought to be at least unconditional, right? They cannot be instrumentally justified. It's the very point of human rights that they do not depend on whether these pays or not for anyone, right? You can claim them no matter what, just because you're your human beings, and you can claim them against states, but you also can claim them against um, businesses without any um, condition. And there you see so there's certain kind of conflict points between corporate social responsibility and business and human rights or human rights responsibilities um, of businesses. All right, so now. I see time is running, so I have to I have to speed it up a little bit. I think. Um, so now, what is the implication, right? So if 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 
we think business and human rights from a corporate social responsibility lens, as we have just kind of gotten to know it now. If you think human rights from the from the perspective that corporate responsibility is private responsibility, um, then the implication is fairly simple, right? Then we we must, by matter of definition, in a sense, see human rights as a private matter as well. So we need to shift human rights into this private space because otherwise we would not see that businesses are responsible for it. Rather than actually thinking corporate responsibility as a public and political manner. And there you see, so, so business and human rights and corporate social responsibility is thinking in two different directions if you think about um, human rights, right? Um, corporate social responsibility means you pull human rights in the private space, which is problematic. Whereas business and human rights means you pull corporate responsibility in the public space. And that would imply also public accountability. That's where the legal scholars um, come in, right? Um, so business and human rights basically advocates for extending public accountability um, to corporations into the private realm, whereas um, corporate social responsibility means um, extending the idea of private responsibility into the space of human rights. Right? And interestingly, when and I didn't even touch on those before, the UN draft norms, which was an, uh, which was an attempt by the UN to install a, a, a legally binding framework back in 2000 and uh, between 1998 and 2003. And there was lots of criticism from the private sector against this, this idea of, of binding um, human rights responsibilities and, and a very prominent um, opposition and, and critique of private business associations was that such an attempt constitutes basically a privatization of human rights. And of course, this, this you could say, well, this, this, this accusation is bogus because it, 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 it's not meant to be a privatization of human rights, but it's meant to be a public accountability of corporations. But if you come from the corporate social responsibility mindset, it kind of makes perfect sense that they would say, that, that, that they would voice this, this critique, right? Because if you think human rights from the perspective of corporate social responsibility, this is exactly what you think about, right? It does mean that you privatize human rights. And then actually the critique makes a lot of sense. It's just that they had the direction wrong, right? They, they, were, they were not thinking correctly about corporate responsibility. Anyway, so this is why business and human rights is not a subset or just a an issue of corporate social responsibility, but it's actually a critical response to it. And it is it is meant to be a critique of conventional ideas of corporate responsibility. Should I skip this? I think I'm going to skip this and go right to. How much time do I have? Uh, well, actually, the, the lecture ends at around uh, three thirty, right? Mm -hmm. Are you should leave some space for yeah, it's there's a commentary by Viviana as well. Yeah, okay, so, so exactly, so I'll skip this, yeah. Just to make sure, actually, tomorrow we are going to address some of the UNGPs from the more normative perspective. Yeah, just okay, so I'll, I'll skip that slide and I go right into, so now this is, now Now we've set the scene. After 45 minutes, we've, we, 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 we're done setting the scene. All right, good, yeah, perfect, perfect. So from this point of view now, we look at um, some of the recent developments that we see in the business and human rights space, especially the policy space, but also in the, in the, in, in the corporate at the corporate level. Um, so the idea that there, there is a that business and human rights correctly understood requires a rethinking of corporate responsibility, right? And now we look at those developments and ask ourselves, is this really the kind of rethinking that we see here? Or perhaps rather not. Right. And then that would imply, well, then we have to probably think beyond what is happening right now. That would be the implication. Mm, okay. So we look at the UNGPs first, UN Guiding Principles of Business and Human Rights. Um, first at the conceptualization right, of, of it. And of course, we start with acknowledging the overarching significance of this instrument. Um, the UNGPs, as I said before, right, this is the authoritative um, framework now at the, at, the, at the global level. And I think all the developments, for better or for worse, but all the developments that we see today 
um, particularly at the international level, but also in the domestic space, to some degree are enabled, some more, some less, but all to some degree are enabled by the, the UNGPs. And now if, a, if, if this is a critique of the UNGPs, it's always relative to a sense, right? Because without the UNGPs, I think we would be nowhere near we are now um, in, in terms of really kind of pushing this, um, this discussion. Um, but if you look at the UNGPs, particularly through the lens of do they actually rethink business in the way and business responsibility in the way they should be, we can certainly say they're a step beyond the kind of very, you know, traditional CSR logic. Um, they're non-binding, um, but they're also not completely discretionary. Um, Raghi was very clear that they apply um, to all businesses, no matter what, um, small, large, national, international. No, it's not about them choosing to adhere the, to the UNGPs, it's, it is an expectation that they do so, right? and they should be doing so. So it's not like the Global Compact where corporations say, yes, we would like to be a member of the Global Compact, and then they, then they sign up to it. Right? The UNGPs have no membership. They're meant to apply to all businesses, whether they want it or not. So it's beyond this kind of discretionary understanding of, of, of voluntarism. Um, but if you read them closely and you, you ask yourself, what kind of business model does Raghi presuppose um, for these um, principles? It is still a fairly conventional idea of business that underlies them, right? It's, it's still, in a sense, the neo neoliberal uh, idea of, of, of corporations as purely economic institutions whose main responsibility just is to, 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 to maximize profits. But he tries to mitigate this, this, this profit making by saying, at least don't do harm when you, uh, when you violate human rights. Right? But it's not that he says, well, the UNGP is, is an attempt to really kind of reframe the business model and the, the business purpose and, and redefine what corporations ought to be. That, that is not at all what this is. Right? Um, so it takes, in a sense, what you could say is that they take a new take on human rights because they do say corporations have human rights responsibility and as such they leave this kind of state centrism that has characterized human rights thinking, but they match it with a fairly conventional idea of corporate or corporations and corporate responsibility. And as we will see later on, this will lead also to certain blind spots, right? Because you kind of marry a, a progressive idea of human rights with a conventional understanding of business, we leave certain gaps that are unaddressed and that eventually we probably have to tackle um, at one point. If you look at the UNGP implementation, so not the conceptualization, but the implementation, what we see today, um, I think, um, but that's that, that that can be contested, of course. But I think what we see today is a certain CSR capture of the of the of the business and human rights space when it comes to the implementation. What we seen very early on, 2011 is when the UNGPs were published. What we saw very early on when they started to, to be implemented by corporations is that corporations use their existing CSR structures um, and 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 mechanisms and systems to first make sense of human rights, because as we just discussed before, right, this was fairly unintuitive for corporations to now have to think about human rights. So first of all, first of all, you need to make sense of what, what is this? How, how do we make sense of this? Um, and then they used CSR structures to implement human rights responsibilities. So they, they, they implemented them in, in the existing kind of frames um, that they have. And those were the frames of this kind of private thinking of, of responsibility. And so what happens, um, I, I think there's no way around it, but what happens if you do that is, is a certain reinterpretation of the business and human rights agenda, right? Um, if, if, if you start to implement them with, with kind of a, a CSR mindset and through it a, a certain co-optation, I think, also of, the, of the business and human rights um, agenda. And one of the practical manifestations, and I've, I've, I've this is kind of a, a, a reference for an article where I try to kind of spell this out in, in a little more detail if you're, if you're interested in, in that. But I think one practical manifestation that we see uh, this happening 
is corporate opposition against those mandatory human rights due diligence laws. So those, those business and human rights laws that are popping up in different, in different spaces. But it's interesting about this opposition against those laws is not the opposition itself, because it's nothing new that corporations would oppose um, those kind of laws. But what is interesting is that they oppose it by pointing to what they do in the CSR space, right? They say, we don't want those laws because they undermine our efforts to be responsible, right? And because they, in a, in a, in a way, use CSR to implement business and human rights, and now are kind of the gatekeepers for, for business and human rights implementation, all those CSR managers say, we don't want those laws because they undermine our attempts to be responsible. And as such, they undermine the implementation of human rights responsibilities. Hence, those business and human rights laws actually go against their very purpose, right? They undermine business and human rights at the core. And that's the idea of the co-optation that is, is taking place, right? That they reframe what business and human rights is all about through a mindset of CSR, and then start to kind of shoot down uh, particular initiatives in the in the business and human rights space, right? Yeah, I think yeah, the, why, why do they say that uh, it's undermining their efforts? Because they're afraid of getting a lawsuit? Uh, if they exactly, it's mostly, exactly, it's most, mostly about the liability piece, right? That they say... They don't want to expose themselves too much. Yeah, exactly. So what they say is, for example, look, we, we, we do, we, we, we're a mining company, we, we, we mine in the, in the DRC, for example, right? And we engage with communities there and we try to do our best and we, you know, we build schools and things like this. And if you now come with those laws, um, the risk for us to actually make mistakes is becoming too large, right? Um, and so we will have to pull out of the, of the DRC. Um, and as such, the laws undermine our very attempt to actually implement business and human rights, right? And there are some examples that may be more plausible, but it, it, and the others that are, are less plausible, right? And it's, I, I think it will be better. I think it's more a matter of how do we actually design those laws to control for those unintended consequences rather than kind of shooting down the whole lot. But it's interesting because I was, I was fairly heavily involved in the Swiss initiative for, for uh, the Swiss Responsible Business Initiative, which also kind of aimed at implementing such a law in, in Switzerland. And that, that was a campaign that started in 2012 and ran all the way to 2020. Right? And it was interesting because there was this shift um, in argumentation. And in the very beginning, I shared panels with, you know, kind of the usual suspects of, 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 of corporate representatives that were just kind of against those laws because it might make them less efficient. And towards the end, all those people were replaced with CSR managers who are normally on my side of the panel, right? And we argue against the other corporate guys why corporations should be more responsive. And all of a sudden, I was arguing against corporate social responsibility managers because they said those laws are actually undermining the business and human rights agenda, right? And so there was this shift of argumentation. I think that is where this co-optation sets in. And I've tried to frame this as a process of domestication, right? First, you see the, 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 the CCSR and the departments start to work with the UNGP, start to implement, trying to make sense of it. So they kind of domesticate them into, into the corporate structure. And then they start to take over and reframe things, right? That's the co-optation. And then they use it to confront um, those unwanted elements of the, of the business and human rights agenda, which have always been a part of the business and human rights agenda. It was always the idea that governments also put mechanisms in place to hold corporations accountable, right? And that's what corporations signed up in the beginning, but, but then it was slowly kind of reframed, right? But again, um, so we, we could talk, of course, um, <laughs> hours about this. But if you're interested, this, it's a fairly short article. If, you, if you're interested, you can, you can read up uh, on that. Right? But that's just one of the, I think, one of the, the implications, again, of thinking business and human rights through this different lens. So it's not, you know, it, it's not just academic hair splitting, in a sense. You, you see kind of that the practical manifestation actually play out today, what, what's actually happening. And, and I think it also, always shows also how us academics are not just, you know, uh, kind of in the leaning tower of 
piece of doing things that are not of practical relevance. I think it does matter what kind of notions we use and, and how we interpret things, because we do see practical implications of that if, if, we, if we understand it um, the wrong way. All right, we, we, we stay at the international level. Um, I'm going to speed things up a little bit. The UN Treaty, I, I briefly touched on this, right? This is kind of this pendulum swinging back, an attempt to come up with a binding uh, international framework. So really in the international law, make it binding for corporations to um, observe uh, human rights. Um, negotiations started in 2015. That was kind of a motion by Ecuador and um, the delegations of Ecuador and, and South Africa. So I thought, well, the UNGPs are non-binding, but we do actually need to, 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 to have more meat on the stick in that sense. And, and they kind of pushed the, the Human Rights Council to start negotiation again. Um, uh, it was adopted and now they're, they're kind of um, drafting and redrafting um, this, this instrument. And now we're kind of in the third or fourth iteration of such a draft. We don't know exactly how long this is going to take, but if you know a little something about how long it takes to, 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 to take a, a treaty from starting point to actually being enacted, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a few, few more years at least. So there's a question from the um, yep. people of distance and uh, I can see does, uh, do the UNGPs uh, create a baseline for business conduct and do local, do, does a local company confronted with lower domestic standards related to the respect of human rights uh, uh, should try or should this company try to abide by the UNGPs instead? So, I mean, do local companies try to abide, domestic companies try to abide to the UNGPs despite the fact that local laws are in substandard, even though they are not an international company, essentially. Yes. And, and so, that's the question, whether they create a baseline for behavior also for domestic companies. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, and Rocky was extremely clear about this, right? So. For those who don't know, the, the UNGPs have three pillars, right? There's a corporate responsibility to, to respect human rights, and that's non-binding. Right? It's, it's social expectations, corporations respect human rights. And then there's the, the, the state duty to protect human rights, and that's a binding, uh, based on international law, a binding duty of states. And then there is the kind of strive for um, improving access to, to remedy for, for the victims, right? So corporations, states, um, and victims. And the corporate responsibility to respect human rights, according to Rugby and the UNGPs, is independent of the state duty to protect. So if the state doesn't um, adhere to its duty to protect human rights, that doesn't um, free the company of its responsibility to respect human rights. To the opposite, I think it makes it even more relevant, right, that the, the, the UNGPs are, are in place. And so I think it was even explicit. So if, if, you, if you are in a situation where local laws may even force you to violate human rights. Apartheid, for example, right? Where corporations had to abide by apartheid laws and discriminate against the black population. Then that might be a case where you actually have to pull out of a, of a country or find ways in which you can operate um, without violating human rights. But the, but the respect of human rights takes precedent over uh, the local laws. And if you can make sure that you operate in law without violating human rights, then um, you might have to find ways, uh, you know, to pull out. Of course, again, in a responsible way, right? Because sometimes it's not all that easy to 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 leave a country. But he's very clear on that. Yeah, absolutely. I think we should have ten minutes more, and then we'll give it to the questions and the comments. That yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah. All right. So I'm gonna gonna jump um, through this. So there's this treaty negotiation in the Human Rights uh, Council. Question is, of course, um, how new um, is this, or how how how, how much new thinking um, uh, is in there? Um, there was quite a bit of new thinking in there. I think in the very beginning. So the very idea that the idea of, of the treaty in the very beginning was that it will hold corporations directly accountable based on international law. That would have been quite a revolution, right? To say, here is a human rights treaty, and it addresses directly companies who then will be um, obligated by international law to um, respect human rights, but that has been eliminated by now. So right now the treaty is back to just um, obligating states. And so the impact of the treaty uh, in that sense will be mostly indirect, right? Insofar that states um, have the obligation to put um, mechanisms in place 
um, to hold corporations uh, accountable. Then you could say, of course, well, how new is this really? Like, how, how different from the UNGPs is this really? Because the UNGPs say exactly the same, right? They say by international, by, by matter of international law, states are in a binding way obligated to hold corporations accountable. It is a little more specific. It, it clarifies particularly important aspects that the UNGPs are vague on, for example, extraterritorial obligations of states. That, can I ask you something? Yeah. Okay, if, if that was binding for corporations, so these treaties wouldn't be such a tribunal for firms, that it's an international tribunal for firms? Do you think there has been a discussion on that, right? There are, exactly, there are discussions. That's, a, that's the, the point down here, yeah. right? So, exactly. So, if, if, you, if you go that way and you say, let's put a treaty in place that where corporations are directly accountable under human rights law, then you also need to think about, well, how are we going to enforce this, right? Yeah. And that all those discussions about, well, you know, do we need a business and human rights court or do we, you know, do we, do we, expand the jurisdiction of the ICC or, you know, how are we going to do this? And all those discussions, I think, will, will need to be had. And those are fairly difficult discussions too, right? So the, so the treaty doesn't stop just at the treaty. It, it, I think it goes on and needs to be embedded in an actual enforcement regime at the, at, at the global level, particularly if you want to hold corporations directly accountable. Uh, corporations should be subject to international law that actually they are not. If you have a tribunal, yes. Yeah. At the moment, they are not subject to international, so there is no tribunal uh, like the international court uh, who assess uh, corporation violations, and the treaties are subjected to ratification by states. So, to be binding, states should decide that that mm, treaty should be binding. So, I'm a little bit skeptical yeah. about. Uh, which is, of course, one of the reasons why ultimately it was kind of yeah. um, eliminated, right, from the from the early thinking and drafts. Uh, I think there's there's some fairly interesting discussions about whether or not, to what degree, corporations may or may not be subject to international law, or whether it actually matters that, that they are not, right? So that there's, there's, especially in the business and human rights space, there's there's lots of writing on on that, right? And ultimately. Some writers come to the conclusion, you know what, keep discussing, it doesn't really matter because they they, they they do have certain obligations already and that would imply that there's like at least some sort of agency in that in that sense, right? But let's move on because we only have like seven minutes or so left. Right? <laughs> so if you look at the domestic space and, and those BHR and business and human rights laws that, that, that pop up and that has really become a trend, particularly in Western Europe, as, as I said, France has one, Germany has one, Switzerland has one, Norway has one. Um, there's this EU directive now, or the proposal for an EU directive, and they vary, right? Some are very general, some are more specific, some are strong, some are weak. Um, but they all aim kind of in a similar direction that so uh, as that they they try to make parts of the UNGPs binding and mostly kind of try to to make the human rights due diligence be. So the UNGP say corporations should do human rights due diligence to respect human rights or to, to adhere to their duty to respect human rights. So act with care, right, basically. Um, and all those laws aim in the direction of making those human rights due diligence, uh, that responsibility a binding obligation. Um, and we'll see, the, the EU directive, I think that could potentially be quite a game changer in this regard because, because of, of the, its reach, but also because it's, it's, it's fairly, fairly strong compared to some of the, of, of, of the laws that are put in, in place. Um, but if you assess those laws just generally, right, it, how, how, new, how much new thinking um, is there? I think we have to, at least at this point, say, they predominantly, I think, purport the, the, the fairly conventional CSR logic, um, insofar as many of them are, are pure reporting and transparency mandates um, that may lead to, to merely symbolic actions of, by, by corporations, kind of this tick box compliance, right, that you, that you put a process in place, but you don't actually have to make sure that those processes actually translate into substantive outcomes. On the ground, and the reason for that, of course, is that the that the enforcement and liability mechanisms are, are mostly kind of watered down through the resistance, mostly of the private sector against those uh, against those laws. Um, 
this does not mean that the law, the idea of such laws itself is bad, right? It just means that we haven't gotten to the point where we've actually, where we actually Im implement the laws that will probably make a substantive difference. I think France is probably now the, the kind of the leading, the leading draft or the leading law in terms of how strong it is, but even that probably doesn't, doesn't go far enough. So we'll see what the EU mandate is going to, uh, it's going to look like at the at the very end. But there is, I think, a danger that those laws kind of go down the same route as as I as I tried to explain before about this cooptation that they that they serve to more legitimize corporate conduct and and, and business as usual than actually making a difference in terms of improving the lives of those whose, whose rights are are violated. Right? Because once those laws are in place. You, businesses can say, well, you know, we have those laws, we adhere to them. Er, hence, what we do is 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 uh, within the within the bounds of, of of the law, and so we shouldn't criticize us for what we do, right? And 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 in that sense, they, it, yeah, it, it may be counterproductive, right? So we need to kind of probably push for for laws that really kind of have stronger enforcement and liability um, mechanisms. Skip the litigation piece, I think, and go right to the corporate level. This is going to be the last one, and then we can we can open it up. So just just a, a brief remark on the on the human rights due diligence piece. Again, this is kind of the centerpiece of the of the UNGPs. Right? The UNGPs say, in order to respect human rights, corporations need to do human rights due diligence. So they basically they basically it's basically a proxy for for human rights respect of businesses. They say. If you do human rights due diligence and you do it correctly, um, you have done your responsibility. Right? Um, and what we see now um, is, is that we that this kind of human rights due diligence idea is expanding in, in different, you know, and now the focus is on interpreting what that means in different industries with regard to different issue areas. Um, you know how it needs to be adapted to to account for certain specific problems in specific industries. Um, lots of, of of organizations provide guidance for human rights relations and and so on. But this is really kind of a a core focus of at the corporate level to make sense of of business and human rights, right? And it is an important I think it is an important tool for the kind of the mainstreaming of the idea of human rights responsibility and also for the op operationalization. Kind of making sense in practice of what that that means. There's no doubt about that. Right? I think it also goes beyond kind of this more conventional CSR logic um, because it's more than just a supplement to doing business, which CSR often is, and it really kind of, at least to some extent, cuts through to the core business processes. Right? It is about how do we actually do business, even if what we do is remains business as usual. But at least we account for some of the impacts that we have, the negative impacts that we that we have, right? Um, but now we, we look back to what we said before. It is an old idea in some sense. Um, human rights due diligence is not a new idea, um, and businesses know what, you, uh, what what due diligence means. That is to some degree why it has been successful as a tool because businesses understand due diligence and it's adapted to a new problem, which is the human rights responsibility. But the problem is, of course, if you if you apply an old idea to a new problem, then there will be gaps that are that that will remain unaddressed. And if you want to address those, I think then you need new ideas for new problems, right? So it is in a, in a way the, a convenient solution that that will will just not address the, the the whole problem. One problem with human rights due diligence is that it inevitably leads to violations without remedy, right? Because if you say, well, all you have to do as a business is, is human rights due diligence. And if you do your human rights due diligence, you have done your responsibility. Human rights due diligence does not mean that no human rights violations will occur anymore, right? Violations will still occur. Because even if you operate with due care, it may still happen that, that you violate human rights. But if then you can say, okay, now we violated human rights, but we did our due diligence, hence, that is not our responsibility anymore, then whose responsibility is it, is it going to be, right? So that doesn't really help the people whose rights are actually being violated. And so you have this gap where you have human rights violations that occur, but nobody's responsible for them anymore because you have kind of 
you have this proxy in, in between rather than holding corporations liable for um, those kind of um, uh, violations. So that's one of the, the problems. I also think it's fairly weak on addressing the, the more structural root causes of, of, of human rights violations. Right? It is really, ultimately, it's a mitigation tool right? and, and that, that addresses in some sense, the symptoms of, of that business is, as usual, right? That you say, well, at least do no harm, right? And, and, and so, but that the harm is coming from somewhere and that there's a kind of, that there are structural underlying problems that lead to that harm is not being addressed in this, in, in, in this tool. And of course we can debate, is this the, the responsibility of business or not? I think it is to some degree, right? The corporation should also have responsibility for, for addressing Poverty, those those kind of things, right? To 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 really address those grand challenges in in more holistic ways, and to say, um, at least do no harm. Um, so I think, and that's the, the last point, um, and then we open it up. Um, I think ultimately there is new ideas there, but ultimately we need to we need to go be, go beyond those. Substantially, I think go beyond that, particularly beyond this human rights due diligence idea. I think ultimately it's about really building rights holder centric organizations holistically. What that means, that's up for debate, but that would exactly be the, that discussion, right? So how do we rethink business in a more holistic way rather than just kind of putting tools in place that account for some of the, of the, of, of the harmful impacts that business as usual has? What does it mean to, to build rights, rights holder centric organizations? What does it mean to reshape cultures, business cultures that, that put rights holders at the, at the center. What does that imply for how we recruit people from, from university? How do, what does that imply for how we teach business and, 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 and educate um, future leaders and so on, right? So this is whole, I think it requires a different perspective on, 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 on the whole and, and even beyond just organization. Uh, I, think, I think what business and human rights as a movement and as a discussion needs is really a broader vision of, of rights holder centric economies, right? That we that we that we come that we move away from thinking about business and human rights merely as an approach to do business to kind of a broader perspective on society and, and, and the economy, right? And think about well, what does it mean to put rights holders at the center of, of an economy and what does that imply, how we structure the economy and how we structure organizations. And for that, I think. We don't even have to reinvent the wheel necessarily. We can just go back to to some of the eminent thinkers in in the space of eco economics and, and philosophy. And Martia Sen that has has made proposals in in this regard. But I think we need to go back to those the, those thinkers and 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 try to understand what they say and what it implies for the business and human rights discussions. And here, I think the non legal disciplines come into the picture. I, we started with kind of separating or, or at least, you know, I, I, I tried to show that there's a legal aspect of the discussion and a non-legal aspect of the discussion. So far, I think the legal side of the discussion has been quite dominant. But I think in this question, this is where us non-legal scholars can really make a big, big difference in terms of rethinking what it, what it means in, a, in, in the larger picture. And I'll leave it with that. If you want to know more, you can also read my new textbook. <laughs> it's right there. Thank you very much. Thanks.